So, und jetzt sitze ich plötzlich alleine hier. Ähm, jetzt kommt der Teil, auf den ich mich besonders freue, der, ähm, den wir schon im Vorfeld aufgezeichnet haben, ähm, in dem wir uns nämlich unterhalten haben mit Johanna Kolionen, ähm, einer der Autorinnen hinter dem Nostradamus Report. Der Nostradamus Report, für alle Leute, die es kennen, erscheint jeweils Anfang des Jahres und gibt einen, ja, einen sehr guten Überblick über das, was sich gerade in der audiovisuellen Industrie, in der Branche tut. Ähm, Johanna Kolionen ähm, verfasst den jedes Jahr und hat einen unheimlich guten Überblick, ähm, was sich tut, welche Trends und Tendenzen sich abzeichnet. Ähm, mit ihr haben wir uns im Vorfeld unterhalten und haben hier zur Seite gesetzt Tatjana, Tatjana Samopjan, ähm, die als Coach und Development Producer sehr viel Autoren, Produzenten und Sendern zusammenarbeitet, wenn es um die Entwicklung von Stoffen geht. Ähm, einmal sozusagen ein Blick aus der Makroebene von Johanna und einmal der Blick aus der Mikroebene von Tatjana, ähm, die beide ähm, ein bisschen das vergangene Jahr in Perspektive setzen. Was hat das bedeutet? Was bedeutet 2020 für die Branche? Und ähm, die Disruptionen, die im Nostradamus-Report schon in den letzten Jahren immer angesprochen wurden und die man, ähm, die man sieht, wie sie sich auch speziell in den letzten zwölf Monaten verschärft haben, sind da natürlich ein großes Thema. Ähm, der Talk geht sehr in die Tiefe, aber ich verspreche für alle Leute, die sich eben ein bisschen tiefer mit den Veränderungen und Verwerfungen der letzten Jahre, der letzten Monate beschäftigen wollen. Das hier ähm, hält sehr viel Einsichten bereit, die sicher weiterhelfen. Viel Spaß damit. You say the disruption is, is accelerating. And, and of course in a way it is, but the word disruption in itself um, centers the traditional way of doing things, the things that is, that is being disturbed. I think from the point of view of, of the audiences, a change that had begun a long time ago and where the audiences are ahead of the traditional media industries has accelerated, right? So the change is absolutely accelerated. And I agree with, with what you're saying, that, that the tendencies that we're seeing this year and almost everything that has played out um, in the industry this year uh, are are things that we have seen that have been going on for a while and are just now going faster. Um, obviously, the, the biggest impact has been the, the shutting down of production almost everywhere, uh, except actually here in Sweden and a, a very few other uh, places. Mm -hmm. And and put in the context of the overproduction uh, of audiovisual content that we have had for many years, uh, in a way, it means that in this forced way, uh, we have put uh, the overproduction problem has in a way is in a way being being addressed at least in the short term, because uh, we were producing globally at capacity. I would say the film and TV content, anywhere you had the the infrastructure to make it, you were you were studios and so on were fully booked, uh, and all of that was put on pause. So now when production starts up again, everything that had been booked up ahead for a year in advance, as well as everything that was booked for whenever it opens will compete about the same infrastructure. So clearly, not everything that was in the pipeline will actually happen. Many projects will get canceled. If we are lucky, the weakest projects or the least relevant projects get canceled. And that is probably healthy uh, in the industry because certainly on the feature film side in Europe and in, in the US, we were making more films than the audience uh, could find. Uh, we, we didn't have channels to place it in front of the, on the audience. So, so in the short term, Uh, we're, we're, have to, we're going to have to be more selective about, about what we produce. And that is actually, I, I think, ultimately uh, a good thing. And then we see what happens. The other big thing is, of course, we came in at the start of this year in the middle of the streaming wars with all of these new global services competing so aggressively for um, the best creators and the most relevant and the most uh, marketable also content. Um, And we have foreseen, and not just me, but everybody has said that, that that market will grow for a few more years and then inevitably it will con contract because at some point, you know, you can't only create the content on debt. That is a good investment for a while, but at some point you're going to have to become profitable. Um, 
And not every one of these organizations needs to make it profits from its content. Amazon is plenty profitable, profitable already. Apple continues to be, be profitable and so on. Uh, but for the, the more pure media organizations, they, knew, do, they do need to make money. Um, and that contraction and consolidation in the streaming space, probably it will accelerate a little bit. We are going into clearly a global uh, recession, recession uh, because of the, of the COVID shutdown. So, so we're looking at the global economy in, in acute crisis for three or five years. And of course, that will affect ad spend and, and so on, and the risk willingness mm -hmm. of the big investors. Uh, so the market will perhaps contract a little bit faster than, than, um, than we predicted. That said, we're making so much content, and we will continue to make so much content. So in a way, in January, we had the problem that the market was expanding beyond the global capacity. So I think now it can contract, and we can perhaps, if in the best outcome, we are operating just at capacity. Everybody will, have, will be working. You know, mm -hmm. and maybe and maybe that that would be the good outcome. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's been good these past few. I don't know how many months, eight months now. Uh, development is flourishing compared to. I, I think there's more work for in development, not in production, obviously. But I haven't noticed any slowdown at all. If anything, there'll be time to focus on development. So so far, so good. We'll see what happens. Projects needs to be chosen for further development, obviously, mm -hmm. but. No, initial stages are going very strong right now. Oh, because writers have been working. Yeah. yeah. Very so hard. would you say that that you know, like I mean, if we mm. combine what we both said, yeah. then in a way we mean that it, the likely outcome is mm. that the project that actually do get selected mm. for production mm. next year or the year mm. after, they will actually be of a higher quality mm. than they yeah. would have otherwise because been. Because there will be more to choose from. Definitely. More to choose yeah. from, and there have been, oh. has been more time for yeah. development. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Definitely, that's what they've been doing all, this, all these months on their own in teams, uh, finding new ways to collaborate online, using new features in Final Draft. I've heard that from several writers, like working together in the same digital space. Um, so far, so good. As I said, they are really working hard, so we'll see what the outcome will be. I'm not seeing necessarily that the COVID is making uh, a direct, the, the, this time, not the COVID, but this time has given uh, an effect of greater quality directly, uh, we'll have to see and wait. Uh, but just more stuff is being developed. That would be. Can neat. I ask a question about that? Because mm -hmm. I, the one thing that that um, I, I was actually I was mentoring some students uh, who were go, doing the next wave program, or the, some professionals who were doing the next wave program uh, out of Berlin this year, and uh, who, who were doing like a real time COVID report about mm -hmm. what was happening in the film industry for the first uh, few months. Uh, which is very interesting, read really, even now when many things have already changed. And one thing that they found out was when they looked at uh, cinemas and, and those kinds of organizations, uh, how they managed in the shutdowns, mm -hmm. they found that the ones that already had uh, a listening relationship to their audience, mm -hmm. to their mm -hmm. own audience, were able to pivot to a, a digital conversation mm -hmm. where they were able to, to really connect mm -hmm. with their mm -hmm. viewers. And, and I, I've talked about this also in, in lectures this year, that one of the things that happened in the film industry is that for the first time maybe ever, we were, you know, the, the humans of the film industry were having the same experiences as mm -hmm. the audience, yes, yes. the same concerns, the same problems, mm -hmm. the same fears. And we, you know, normally we are very isolated as an industry mm -hmm. from our actual viewers, which is uh, terrible for relevance. And also, I like, that's an artistic mm -hmm. problem. But this year we have been doing the same things as, you know, because ev yes. everybody in the world has yes. shared the same concern. That so, would be so amazing if, that's, yeah. if that is taken hold of. If that goes into the writing, but you haven't seen it in the writing yet? Well, I've been seeing something uh, over the past few years, so I can't really isolate this period that much from that. But I've been seeing, like, if, if, if you try to assess the quality of a story, I've, I'm looking at the quality of expression uh, or execution, how well it is made, how well it is told, how engaging it is, mm -hmm. and the quality of perception, how, like how nuanced is the grasp on life and reality. So the best stories would be like a finger pointing to the moon directly. So they are really pointing us back to life mm -hmm. because n the nuance is so close that you can taste life in it. And it can be set on Mars, I don't care, it can be in any genre, it's not that, but you can really taste the closeness to reality and you kind of even inspire to engage back with life. Most stories are fingers pointing to other fingers, which means they are referring to other stories. And the, just the crappy stories are fingers pointing to other fingers in a hall of mirrors. 
and the moon is waving from above the ceiling, like, look at me, life, you know, physical reality, and nobody's connecting to it. So the bulk of it would be fingers pointing to fingers in the hall of mirrors, and then better quality, still too much derivative self-referential um, exercise in the world of storytelling. So stories that are inspired by other stories. Yeah. And my job is often to like gear, take people away from stories, like really jerk their minds from the programming that comes from being immersed in storytelling for decades. And the, the most amazing writers are, are people who, are, who live in a very embodied way in reality and have the storytelling talent. With them, the work is just flow. There is no resistance. Whatever I challenge, they, they go and you know, no, they find out about life and they come back with a story about it. But I would say that has always been the minority of creatives, artists, definitely. And the more uh, narratives we, we have around us, the more we are drowning in them. And this is unprecedented level of storytelling. We are a gener generation of people who are drowning in stories. You can tell that storytelling is, is pointing to it, back to itself all the time. Uh, just, well, I'm, I'm becoming yeah. sensitized to it uh, very much. I, I forget now suddenly, yeah. uh, stupidly, what, what he calls it. But Jean Baudrillard, of course, yeah. talks about this. But when you only have signifiers pointing yeah. To, yeah. to other yeah. signifiers, yeah. Yeah. it yeah. becomes disconnected from the yeah. world. And I think maybe mm. when I'm saying that we as an industry are disconnected from our audience, that is also what I mean. That, that, that mm. if you, especially if you're even a little bit successful, you're, you're living a kind of very uh, elevated uh, middle class creative lifestyle mm. with a quality of, um, of, of life and, and a, a style of life that mm. is just not representative of the majority, mm. even of the people in the same cities that we live in and so on. So, so and we, and I mean, the, the dark scenario, what happens mm. in COVID to writers is to bubbles, retreat yeah. into our bubbles right. and, we, and we have less uh, mm. contact mm. with reality. And we write more from, from derivative ideas and archetypes mm. and less yeah. From, yeah. from experience. Yeah. So that would be terrible. Probably we will see both, mm. right? Yeah, I'm seeing both yeah. and I'm choosing projects. That's, that's <laughs> the the yeah. thing, good thing is when you get to a place where you can choose, then you can choose the ones that, that have some vivacity in them. So it's. There, there, there is good stuff out there. It's but then we're <laughs> back to the competitive market, which is there is just no place. There is yeah. zero place for mediocre content. Yeah. There is zero place because, you know, the, any derivative idea you have, there will be 50 other people, yeah. 100, 5,000 other people in the world who mm. are just as talented as you or much more talented than you, who, mm. you know, who have the same idea to work in the same genre in the same derivative way. And they, one of them will find a new take. Yeah. And that's the one that's going to hit. Uh, and I think another, uh, of course, macro trend that we're seeing now, uh, this is a horrible thing to say uh, in a way. I, I don't like to say this out loud, but I think we have to face, we are just now approaching the US election. Uh, so when we are having this conversation, it hasn't yet occurred. Uh, and I, it is difficult to see any outcomes that would would um, be peaceful and prosperous for, for the United States in the next year, especially given how their COVID is going. So, so this, you know, in many ways, we are um, at the end of the American empire, culturally speaking, economically speaking as well. And it means that the, um, the balance of cultural attention in the world is shifting. And the global players are seeing very clearly what is happening. And, it, and, and also because of EU legislation and other things, they are invested very much in storytelling in other languages. So, so stories from anywhere in the world, and in particular Europe, so in a way this is good for us, stories in the European languages all have a chance to, to, to perform globally. Mm -hmm. But that also means that you are, you are now competing with the best writers and the best producers mm -hmm. everywhere in Europe and a lot of other places mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. so, so it has to be real, you know, it has to have something unique or it's not going to fly. And the broadcasters are looking specifically for authentic voices. They don't know what it is, they can't define it. Sometimes they can't even recognize it. <laughs> you, you can't be, it can't be guaranteed, but that's, that's the thrust of it. They, they want to go through authenticity. And then the, the, the challenge is that somebody with, with an authentic take on reality is not necessarily the best storyteller. Mm -hmm. And then finding the ways to either teach people very quickly the craft or pair them up with, with uh, a bit jaded, but really, really uh, skillful skilled writers, so bring them new blood somehow. And I'm seeing those kinds of tries happening. Uh, even I have had those conversations, like how, how do you teach them quickly uh, that which takes decades really to learn. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see what happens there.
when we say diversity, it means many things. It, it, it can mean diversity across genres, diversity um, across experiences, di diversity uh, um, in the artistic range of methods that is allowed to, to, you know, to be explored within the parameters of, of something. Um, because of the sheer volume of the audience, you are able to do niche works for very many people, and so it becomes a financially, financially viable to do it with big, big budgets. But also uh, because everything, you know, you, you, can, you can take a chance if you're a very big player and you have a big catalog of, to be honest, pretty standard mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. then you can also put some money into some creators and let them work, you know, in, in peace on inventing the next, uh, the next way of, of telling stories. And in addition, yes, we have also seen more diversity in the, in the sense of, of um, uh, of intersectional justice, so so you're seeing more creators of different generations, of of different ability, different uh, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, and so on, and different language groups as well in the commissioning. Um, but I think it's worth looking back and saying, you know, one of the reasons that feature film, uh, in in particular in Europe, also in the U.S., has become less and less relevant in the last two decades to to especially the younger audiences, is that we didn't have an artistic breakthrough. Uh, 20 years ago, you know, that, they, that they, we, we sort of missed the generation of, fi of, of feature filmmakers because that talent was drawn into the renaissance of TV storytelling. Um, and, and one of the reasons for that was that we know from research that TV offered and still offers better opportunities for women and minorities uh, as writers and as directors than feature film does. So of course, the most talented women and, and minority uh, creators are going to go to television. Mm -hmm. And then, and that's a the scale. Then the, the streamers who are a kind of amped up television, mm -hmm. they offer even more opportunities for that. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't do it out of the kindness of their heart. This is not charity, you know, these are businesses. But because they understand that if the content isn't working with the audience, mm -hmm then nobody will watch it and then it has no value for them financially. So they have to make things relevant and you have to do things relevant, you know, by listening to who is your audience. And I'm sure in some countries, for instance, I'm, I, I'm sure, unfortunately, we're going to see in some places in Europe that diversity initiatives that are about uh, bringing out other writers of other kinds of backgrounds than, than white middle class men, <laughs> you know, that some of those maybe will be rolled back and there might be, again, so le less opportunities in the, for new talent in the interest of maintaining existing careers. This can absolutely happen. But it's very counterproductive because in, in, instead, I think, we have to think uh, like the big ones, you know, invest out of the crisis. If we feel like we need to grow our audience, we grow our audience by speaking to more audience groups. So the more diverse you are able to create stories, you know, you can create new money by creating, by attracting new audiences and, and monetizing their attention. And I think that's, that's the reason. We also have to do it because it's right. You know, justice is very important. And democracy, obviously, you know, fascism is the second greatest threat to our life, you know, today after climate change. But really, it does, like, you don't have to believe that. You no, know, it's true, but you don't have to believe that because even for business reasons, the outcome is the same. The diverse voices have to tell stories because you grow the audience mm -hmm. through relevance. So instead of looking at life in all its complexity, you get hooked onto certain ideology. And we are used to terming ideology as fascism, communism, and feeling sorry for the people of, you know, old agents and oh poor them, how, how did they live then? Without ever really realizing that we are also living in our own ideologies all the time. So you can see, um, yes, writers want to engage with reality, but through pushing a social agenda a lot of the time. So you'll see a, maybe a good, I'm, I'm really struggling to, to explain this to writers sometimes. So I, so I settled on the metaphor of, of the elephant in the room and blind people touching the elephant and describing the elephant to each other. So say you have the butt in front of you, it's huge, it's a huge issue, it's a gender issue, it's a, the butt. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 know, you touch your dead butt really well and everything is about it. And then on the other side there's a whole lot of elephant left which you've completely excluded because that's, your, that's not your agenda, that's not what you're pushing. So everything becomes about gender, for example, in a story. Or it, everything uh, becomes about climate, or everything becomes... So even though you have 10 hours to tell a story in a series, uh, you're telling really well a portion of truth. So these are not people 
uh, peddling lies about reality. They are peddling partiality. Mm -hmm. in a, it's not peddling. It's really doing the well, doing the storytelling well on a part of reality, but kind of becoming <laughs> like a horse, not wanting to see what's out there. Especially if other parts of the elephants have other colors, they are contradicting a little bit of the texture of the butt. And the butt is so huge. So I'm so, sorry to be stuck, but I want to say you see something big in front of you, uh, and you put your, all your effort into it. But if you go out and do research about any topic in life, and you really expose yourself without too many preconceptions, or you're aware when your preconceptions, uh, preconceptions hijack your attention completely, so you train yourself, then suddenly there is so much contradictory information reality, so many, so many contradictory things happening. Life becomes so fascinating. People become so fascinating. Trends become so fascinating. And then the story just explodes in so many colors at the same time. But it takes a person a lot to be able to do that because they will get transformed. They get rewritten. Um, so this is, a, this is what's going on. People who are willing to do that, they end up telling stories that surprise. People who are willing to um, tell us something about reality that's really important right now, they may do it well, but they also engage more in social activism than storytelling. And I think the TV series medium mm. is very uh, important here because in particular if you're writing multi-hour drama, you mm. know, you, if you don't have many perspectives, it's n nobody's going to be able to sit through that. You know, mm. the dynam dynamism is also in those, in those different uh, I wish uh, it viewpoints. Was, I was thinking all the time that must be it, that mm. was, that's where the juice is, that's where the conflicts are. And I started to really x-raying stories and like, oh God, no. So you can get really good at hooking attention to a certain part of reality without ever referring to other parts. It takes a lot to get out of the hypnosis and say, what's missing here in this picture? Because what's presented is so uh, presented in a way that manipulates your attention mm. and your emotions that you're completely hooked into it. So to be able to step out of the story, it's something that a viewer needs to be trained in, which we haven't been. There is no school teaching us to, to understand narratives and how they, domin uh, how they uh, affect us. But if we take a really simple example, so like something like The Wire, surely the reason that that, that project of describing that city works is because it allows itself um, to, to, to understand all the conflicting viewpoints. Yes, yeah, you and know. why The Wire is the example I keep repeating, and repeat. yeah. I can't find equivalent except, you know, uh, newer series that do it really well like that. Like, I end up going back to Wire to point out, look, this is also possible, but it's not the mo most dynamic stories. Mm -hmm. No. Really, and people want to hook, they want to do the hooking and the Wire, and then the, it gets cross-wired somehow. But I, yeah. I think there's something here also, which is about, if, if you are making um, art about big issues, mm. you know, gender or climate change or something like this, you, you have personally found, you have personal reason or personal you know, insight but that this is very important. Mm -hmm. And you want to make art about it because you want to make change in the mm -hmm. world. And I think that if, you know, if it was easy to change, if you, could o if you could change this thing by only pointing out this exists and it is unjust, then we would have solved it a long time ago because you will not be the first person to point out this exists and this is unjust. So I also think that if you're in, invested in changing the reality, you have to put yourself into that place of discomfort and mm. understand what are some other perspectives. Mm. What are the, the structures that keep this in, um, that maintain this state of affairs that, you know, and, and they are complicated. And then you have to point, you know, make a selection where you are able to talk about complexity and that can even be inside one character, mm. you know, but so it, and that doesn't have to be what drives the story, but, but what ha it has to be what drives the understanding is to weighing these different um, perspectives on a complicated issue together. And of course, the wire is about, you know, the state of American society through the prism of a whole city. So of course, it becomes incredibly complex. But storytelling about issues doesn't have to be that big. You can locate it in a very small group of people and in a genre or in a, some other environment that in its, by itself carries more momentum as well. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that we don't see it done very well very often, but, c but there is a will to, um, to tackle these big issues. And then you, when you work in development with that, the, the question is then not about not focusing on the story in the beginning, it's like focusing about everything that's there and then what's not there and then how to bring it into the story. Mm -hmm. So it takes a while before the story starts running 
because there are, there are just blind spots in different places but that need to be covered. Can I defend the writers a little bit? Because mm. I feel well, I'm defending yeah, that no, with no, the whole time. No, no, but I, I feel I'm like you're saying you're, you're, I feel like you're saying you're never seeing writers like really do this. And I think that that in a way what Gahor was asking was um, is it, the, does it go better for writers who engage closer, to listen more to the audience, was in a way the original question. And I think the answer is damn yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like that is absolutely, it absolutely helps. If you're writing about some, someone who is not you, uh, someone who, is, who does not share your immediate uh, experience, there's a separate conversation about in, in a time when some voices have not been heard at all, should perhaps the people with the greatest expertise of certain experiences be writing those stories? Largely, yes, I agree. But you know, if I'm a white middle-aged woman, if I want to write a story about a, a white 13-year-old um, girl from my own culture, I don't know, like it's a whole different species. So I would still have to immerse myself into, into that audience. And especially if I'm speaking to that audience, I, I would have to spend real time, quiet, non-judging time. Yeah with the people and the environments in, in living that life in a way. That's a prerequisite, not only afford, um, that's not the time, time is not always given to writers no. for that. And that's usually, the, it, it's not an excuse, it's an explanation why the research is not done. But whenever it's done, yeah. and there is a skilled writer doing it, it just elevates the story to a completely different level. So a lot of the time it has to do with research before the story starts happening. And, and that puts mm. us in this marketplace, like with, when we are in a killer mm. marketplace, you know, even if you're a very good writer, you are competing with other writers who are just as good as you. Mm. What can you do that is unique? Yes, you have to follow your passion, but you have to, mm. you know, you'd have to take that fire in your heart and, and uh, combine it with the research mm. that, you, that, uh, allow, that you allow to change yourself mm. and yeah. you can learn. Yeah. Then you can write something yeah. that is yeah. outstanding, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And those people and those processes are the most amazing. Yeah, it's the best, <laughs> like it's the best. Yeah. The best job to have when we you hear when a you lot of that. pitches. Yeah, we hear, <laughs> <laughs> when it happens, it's the best. Yeah. yeah. Like maybe five years ago, yeah, a lot of people, certainly here in the Nordic countries, you would go into production too early mm -hmm. because there wasn't enough work to go around. And when like you were struggling as a small production company in particular to survive, so the moment you had the money, you had to start shooting immediately so to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. And that affected, of course, quality. Then, you know, we fast forward to like uh, the, you know, the beginning of this year even and people were in the position where when you have the talent and the funding lined up and you have the, the production infrastructure, you have to go because, you know, if it's delayed, you will not, you will not get those things aligned again. Mm -hmm. And that also affected quality. Um, and, and as you are saying, these American models of production, also an American funders' expectations, American com commissioners' expectations, certainly also forced people into that kind of, of, of style also in Europe, in a lot of production environments where I think um, it was very inappropriate. Um, now, we have had this um, struggle uh, with a lot of the American services or global services about uh, maintaining or keeping some rights with the producers and so on and like negotiating. Um, and I think we were in a position just, a f you know, in the last few years where you, we have been so grateful. If you are allowed to do something for Netflix or for HBO, you do it almost at any terms because it's very nice to get to do a big profile thing with a big budget. Uh, so you take it no matter what. But, but we have seen tendencies, uh, especially in the last year, that because there is so much competition for the best talent and the most interesting content and the best projects, that it's possible to push back a little bit in the negotiations. And, and one of the areas where it has been possible to push back is that some creatives in some countries, I'm thinking, for instance, about how British writers work, certainly also the Danish you know, writers, there are some other examples mm -hmm. also, that they say, no, like we, we can't produce like that. No, you're not going to get a season every year. You know, if you want to work with us, like either you pay us to write the whole season, no matter how long it takes, or three seasons, you know, and then you get to make this whole show five years from now. And no, of course, nobody does that. So then, they, okay, no, you know, because if you want the quality, then you have to work in the way that those writers work. Or you're not working with those writers because they can't work in any other way. The reason they have pro produced consistently high quality work is that they are allowed to take yeah. the time it takes. And now that has value in the market but also license to go to uncomfortable places and, and challenge the zeitgeist a little bit. Because uh, the pressure really comes at writers in such ways that they internalize it and then they start uh, self-censoring. 
and it can take many, many interesting forms. Uh, like as people, they see reality in a far more complex way and they, they allow themselves to write about. And uh, discovering that, uh, challenging that, but of course the, the issue is not the, just the personal in the writer, but they are being told if you, if you put, put this piece of reality, uh, if you talk about these things, you will trigger so many people. And I can give completely just specific examples, which I'm seeing time and time again in different countries, but uh, for example, about gender issue and gender dynamics and uh, structural reasons behind the Me Too situation and everything. So you can tell a story about that really well and really lift it to, to the light. But if you move around in reality, since you were in high school, let's say, you encountered also dark feminine which isn't a product of a structural oppression by patriarchy. It's, a, it's a, an independent force, like sex, sexually empowered woman manipulating to get something to, for her ends. That's also a phenomenon. It can't weigh up the structural oppression, but it, if it's completely neglected from the story, because it muddies the waters in reality, it makes it so complex to navigate relationships and situations that can't be really understood. Not even to mention it in a story, because it may trigger reactions, uh, makes the story lopsided, and the writers will be able to handle it if, if then a producer say, no, 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 this is too hot away. Mm -hmm. Not, it's not the time is not right for that side of the story. But that side of the story exists in reality, parallel with everything else that's going on. So that's where where I'm getting a, a little bit stuck with. It's not enough. To, it's not okay to say to writers, you, you know, artistic free, freedom, just do your thing, because they will hit the wall at the producer's door. They will hit the wall with the broadcasters. And their arguments, this is a real thing, the situation is this complex, uh, may not fly all the way. Yeah. So this is what I'm seeing, self-censorship with good reasons. And it's a, it's a thing I'm not seeing being discussed because the obvious stuff is being discussed, the obvious trends, the equality, all of, everything that you were talking about, that's being tended to much better than ever before. And it's even certain perspectives are becoming mandatory and that's wonderful. But then when is the next step when we can complicate it a bit, complicate it a bit, take in the dark sides that we don't want to look at now. And that's, that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, but at the same time, like, I, I, I agree with you, but it, I, I'm also, I also understand that self-censorship. Uh, if, let's just take like a super simple ex example, um, you know, we know that, that, that uh, so if we're thinking, like, and of course, Me Too was about a lot of things uh, and a lot of structures, but if we take it just the most black and white simple things mm -hmm. that are about, about ex expressly sexual violence, there are, there are certain, you know, statistical things about this where we know that, that the majority of the perpetrators are, are men and the majority of the vi victims are women. And then just like level one, and level two is to be able to remember to say, oh, there are also many victims who are men, which is also true. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, to be able to say there are also some perpetrators who are women. And now, percentually, when mm -hmm. it comes to specifically sexual violence, that is a relatively small mm -hmm. uh, one. There are many reasons for this. Uh, and that story already is a little bit uncomfortable mm -hmm. to tell. And then if you take it, okay, but, you know, and, and then there, but there are also people, many people in the world who genuinely don't believe you know, in these structures mm -hmm. and don't believe in the existence of the patriarchy and who don't believe, for instance, that the, even the number mm -hmm. that the majority of, of, of rapists are, are men, regardless of the, of the sex of the victim. And to, if you tell the third story, those people will use Who's that context? story That's out it. of context for their purposes. And mm -hmm. that is a real, and we mm -hmm. see this all the time. So that the forces for darkness that I would call it, you know, e people who are working towards mm -hmm. evil, non-humanist ends, are exploiting nuanced storytelling to tell unnuanced stories. So in a way, the challenge, uh, but I think good writers can mm. do this, is to say, how can you tell the first story and the yeah. third story in the same story? So you it's cannot that take it. You, so you if can't you take it out of context, you know? If you, you, you can't discern it in life, you want to be able to discern it in story. So yeah. th there, is, there's a, there is a two-way street between the viewer and the the, the, the writer, the sender of, 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 of the story. So you can't get away from that. You can't teach people how to think and see. They have to do it on their own and see what happens. But it's fascinating that, that because the reality is really there are big stuff, there, there are small things, they, it's it just a wonderfully complex structure. And to reduce it 
to a story is already simplifying it a lot, but to simplify a simplified story is already... Yeah. So that's and then a we're back to yeah. like how much, yeah. like for instance, in that case, some of it is about gender, but primarily the reason that the numbers work mm. out like this is that isn't because of patriarchy. It's not about gender, mm. uh, ultimately, about it's about yeah. power. Yeah, of course. And, and then you say, okay, but we're not telling stories. Like when we're telling stories about sexual violence, what if these stories are not about gender, they are about power? And then it just that shift mm. in your mind, you can already start to think about like, ah, okay, like here we see these things, but maybe, you know, it's, you know, in season three or whatever yeah, of the yeah. show, we are also seeing, you know, and I, I have to say, I see more, um, I see more complex women with power mm. on television today than I have seen ever in my life. And they are, you know, I just, last in the, I'm watching How to Get Away with Murder now. Mm -hmm. Of mm -hmm. course, it's a melodrama, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a melodrama you know, with one of the things is nobody gets to be, nobody, no, no, no character gets mm. to be good, you know. Uh, and but in all its simplicity, I, it's just being, seeing like middle-aged women with a lot of power make terrible choices. Mm. It's incredibly liberating. Not because I want to be, emulate them, but because I know that those women also exist in the world. Sometimes. <laughs> you know, the, the women I hang with, not evil, <laughs> but we don't always make the best choices because we're human, and and and, and that and that makes it so much more relevant to me than a lot of much more like you know subtle content, let's say. Yeah. Well, there's so much to explore here. I don't know where, which where the stories are going. I can't really put my finger at. I'm just fascinated by the ride. Yeah, we're really, really something is happening with the like how much complexity complexity came in a bite into and mm -hmm. take it into story which is still engaging and not, you know, boring your wits out of you. Uh, that's the challenge. But I mean, in a way, yeah. you, you talked about narratives before, like that the we internalize. As an industry, uh, maybe because we're storytellers, we are in so astonishingly mm. good at telling stories about our own industry that are complete crap. Irrelevant. And then, and no, and, and then we believe it. Mm. So mm. people, you know, we, you, whenever you hear somebody say like, you know, audiences don't like this or that, or like there is no audience for this, or it, this will never, like that moment, those, those are weasel, the mm. moment somebody yeah. says it will never, or audiences do not. I'm, I'm often, I'm like, probably that's not even literally true. You know, for years and years in Hollywood, uh, the major studios were saying, you know, unfortunately audiences do not want to see casts with people of color in them. And every year there is a Fast and the Furious movie in the top 10. Hollywood is saying, you know, which is, you know, but by, especially by then standards, very diverse. Or, or every year Hollywood is saying, unfortunately, we can't make any original IP stories because no original IP does well. Now, every year in the top 10, there is a Pixar story, which is always original IP. Like even on the most basic level, our own narratives about our own industry, we don't even base it on our own personal experience. We are so much simulacrum. Yeah, that's what Baudrillard talks about. We are in that simulacrum, you know. So, so like, no, but what do we actually know? And I always say, whenever you're surprised, you know, if a movie does better than you thought, that's a clue. Mm. Go look, like, why is this working? When you read the industry papers and it says, this and X film has overperformed. Overperforms means we did not trust the audience to like this. Mm. You know, very often, Jordan Peele releases a movie, 100% of the time it says overperforms. We mean, mm. We mean black people don't go to movie theaters and white people don't want to see films about black people. This is bullshit. Clearly, these films have an audience and at, they don't overperform. They perform just fine. We as an industry have underestimated mm. the audience interest. We have failed. It isn't the audience, you know, that has does, done something. It's the person who did the estimate. Mm. So, uh, and you know, in the Nordics, we always said, Unfortunately, you know, Nordic young teenagers will never watch Nordic content. So that's that. Unfortunately, that train yeah. has sailed. The Americans have made it impossible. And then the Norwegians make scum. Mm -hmm. And and suddenly it's like, oh, like, oh, if you make, well, I mean, obviously, well, if we make content that is about actual young people, which is based on a lot of immersed research, then mm -hmm. it can work. And then that becomes the truth. You know, so never, never say never. Uh, mm -hmm. if, I, I genuinely, like in, in the, also in my consulting, but also in my work, if you say never, this can never happen, unless it's because of you know, gravity or some natural law like this, you have to ask yourself, what you should ask yourself is what would it take? What would it take to X? What would it mm. take to get uh, German 22-year-olds to a cinema to see a film in German? 
Because if Germany is anything like, you know, well, the other countries we look at, young people go to the cinema all the time. They just don't watch our local content. They're, the, they're big consumers of that medium. So what would it take? What kind of film would make them show up? And don't say it has to be a YouTuber in the, you know, you know, you know. These kids are not idiots, you know. They need to get consultants of the, from the audience. Yeah. They're really, they need to consult the audience for everything. But I think also if you're working uh, with entertainment and you don't speak every day to a person who is under, let's say, 27, yeah. like just look around your office or, you know, your organization, even if it's on Zoom, mm -hmm. every day you have to talk to one person who is significantly younger than you. Otherwise, you're losing the audience mm -hmm. over time. That's just the way it, it's going to go. If you're in a commercial organization, you have to look at the numbers. Uh, you, and you might have to not just look at ratings and reach, but like uh, do some qualitative work. Mm. Uh, how many shows do you, okay, you have young viewers, they're watching X hours, but how many shows do you have that they would say that has changed their life mm. or that they are obsessed with? I'm mm. obsessed with this. Mm. You, know, the, you know, is there an emotional reaction at all or is it just what they watch, watch to fill the time? That's one metric. You know, you can have other uh, performance indicators. Uh, if you're in a selective organization, um, then I think it's, it, yeah, then, then I think you maybe have to question, in a way, the goals of the organization, because, yeah. because then you have to think about, like, am I currently working to maintain existing careers, which in some public fund context is absolutely valid, I want to make clear. Uh, that is not necessarily even against the rules. But, but you have to say, am I working now for the industry or for the audiences? And I think a lot of people in selective commissioning, uh, selective funding in Europe are working for the industry primarily, whatever we say. We are working for the industry's interests, not for the audience's interests. And it's complicated. The audience is, is all kinds of people, you know. Mm. But I think one group, we are failing very clearly because that we can see in the numbers. Clearly, we are failing in all of Europe. We are failing our, our young audiences. They don't care because, because as you say, like the content we, that is made for them is not relevant. And the reason what's happening with, you know, if, the, if they go to Netflix, and that's largely shit, as you know, mm. for their, that view audience as it is, they're not going to go watch a German show instead that is also shit. They're going to go to another medium. You know, they're yeah. going to add more hours to their gameplay or more hours yeah. on Instagram, more hours. In they're going to do other, other media They're going to do other yeah, things, no. yeah. Exactly, exactly. They're going to spend more time watching uh, people speak, you know, do live broadcasts on Twitch, just talking about their day. Because yeah, that commenting is more, on games is more yeah. interesting than watching yeah, or, or not even games, just yeah. watching, watching you know, whatever. talking about themselves. It's uh, become yeah. a, an increase, increasingly growing thing. It's mm. just like people talking. So, of course, young people talking mm. to each other about real things is more mm. uh, relevant than, than some incredibly derivative show made with a slightly too small budget in an incredibly predictable way, you mm. know, in a, for a minor U.S. studio. So, yeah, mm. and, and that is so short-sighted. If we don't, we have to go through quality and passion because otherwise, we're, you know, the, we're going to lose the audience for this entire medium, film and television. It's going. It's going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not easy to give recommendations to broadcasters channels when they ask, OK, you'll analyze the project and what, where do you see it go? I said, I have to know the, your slate. I, I, w I need to know what you what you hope, what your hope for this project is. Are you serving people with some time off? from the pressures of their lives, you know, so time off from complexity, fine, this can do the job, this is what the doctors ordered for passing out in a pleasant way in front of TV. But if you want something that will engage people and they'll talk about it later and you'll see like the trail through other types of media about it, then this show can't perform not even nearly, it's, it's like a death toll for exactly what you're trying to accomplish. So it's very difficult on, on the level of show itself to give any prediction about how it, well it will do, well, depending on what you want to use it for and what you hope the, the audience will use it for. Um, I'm, I'm just, I was just yeah. writing re look, a few years ago and analyzing a show for, for a German broadcaster and I remember how am I going to explain this um, exactly, this show can do this but not this and I'm thinking, a friend called me from, from Canada, she's 40 and she says, well I'm living on your time zone now. I said, why? What's wrong? She says, well, you know, I have so many things to do now and I can't deal with them. So I'm binging on Shadow Hunters on Netflix. They, like every single free moment, my time zone has completely switched and it's a bloody shallow show, but it's the only thing I can process right now. So in her life, it feels that purpose, but she's not unaware of what she's watching, not for a, for a second. 
She's like, this is a guilty pressure that gets me through my day. So of course, that, that show can do that, but not much more. Don't even have an illusion that it's for something else. We've also seen a yeah. growth in people re-watching things they have seen yeah, yeah. before. Yeah, we're talking about something incredibly important here, mm -hmm. which is that, of course, television is not just one thing. Like, of mm -hmm. course, film is not just one thing. And I think increasingly, I'm finding it, like we talked about art house even in this conversation, I find it increasingly difficult to say what is an art house film. Like, mm -hmm. I know what is a purely festival film, I know what kind of film will only work in a festival context and nowhere else. But I also know that festivals will screen all kinds of other films that I would consider also art house film that can also, you know, will work and will reach mm -hmm. a big audience in a lot of places and that it will often be a crossover audience mm -hmm. also. And that's not weird. Lars von Trier had a big audience, you know, Tarantino had a big audience. In, in the generation that I come mm -hmm. from, a lot of the films that got me into this to begin with uh, spoke incredibly um, powerfully and rawly to broad audiences, mm. you know, that made them incredibly excited about cinema again. And that can absolutely, and that's what's happening, you know, in the, in the you know, author, and, but also otherwise qualitative film space, absolutely uh, possible. And I hope we get a resurgence of content like that. But, but I think that because release strategies I mean, clearly the windows are, are changing already like that. And that has accelerated a lot this year. Um, so we now have to start to ask very intelligent questions about which film, which TV show is served best by which mm -hmm. um, release strategy. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we will realize that they are slightly different media. It depends very much on where is the, like the nature of the story is that will shape the format. Like what is it possible? What does this story need? And then you know who is this for? Like who am I speaking to? So depending on where your where your audience is, who your audience is, then you know where their attention is. Then you work backwards from that to monetize that. So in a, in a place where where the story needs are served and the audience is present, and then whatever financial space is enabled, you know, in wherever that is, that's how you have to do your your financing and, and distribution strategy. And that's not going to be one model, even for feature film. It's not going to be one model for television because already we have all you know we have so many ways of making TV now, from being almost like a contract producer to a big streamer to to a completely different models to working with your local broadcasters to making pan-European deals. Like so many different ways, and those will absolutely shape the creative processes, what is possible, who has final cut. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these things are shaped by the nature of the project. And, and I do feel like we see, especially in pitches, that sometimes you're early in a project and you think, like, oh, but I want to be on Netflix, or oh, I think this Everyone is going to be. Everyone wants, it's well, like every, every everybody pitch says, is on Netflix. It's, I'm, I'm making something serial, so obviously it will be yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think, maybe not, you know, yeah. maybe not, but okay, but if it is, tell me mm -hmm. why. Like, what, do, what does this give to the slate of Netflix in a way? Um, and, and I think that we're, we're going to have to think in a much more nuanced way about uh, format um, um, categories, right? So we, we, yes, we're format agnostic, but that doesn't mean that it's irrelevant. It means the opposite. It's much more important now than Spring. ever before to understand who is the audience, what is the format, the story needs, the format needs of the story, and that's going to be how you find every place. And maybe you know, maybe maybe there's not one correct answer. Maybe there is three different answers for your project. But those will put you in very different places and, and also shape the, um, some of the story possibilities for you very differently, I think, mm -hmm. depending on the, on the production context and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, when the writer is a powerhouse of a person and has those types of talent, that's completely legit. Some people are really uh, versatile. Others are not, and shouldn't be asked to be that, but what's needed then is a collaboration with a good creative producer and an executive producer, and that team to gel well. So sometimes you have two or three heads just doing a wonderful job. So I'm not sure you can always ask the writer to become that kind of showrunner inside. Some people can do it, and some really are best left to to create with the input of, of the reality check that comes from producers. So the, the European models with, with the writer and producer is still wonderful, why wouldn't we keep it? Like people know how to collaborate. No, the people know how to collaborate well. So yeah. yes and no, I would say. But yeah. that said, we are, because we are, of course, also, we're not seeing, it's already happened, film and TV is the same industry now since some, some time back, but the people, individuals yeah. who are, have crossed over into this new hybrid form, 
they don't have the same amount of experience in both yeah, things. Yeah, that's really you today. see a lot of film <laughs> producers, for instance, mm -hmm. who don't actually understand very nuancedly about the different kinds of television. And they think, well, I know how to produce films, so of course I can also produce a TV show. Can you, though? And I, I remember mm -hmm. the first time I sat down in, in some context with, with Tatiana, uh, and you were, we were listening to a pitch, this is years ago now, and somebody was pitching a comedy. And they wanted it to be for HBO. And you said, you said to them so patiently, you said, this is the number of scenes you have written in your script. Mm -hmm. Now, in an HBO 30-minute comedy, there is this number of, 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 um, uh, of scenes uh, in this number mm -hmm. of minutes. Now, on, a, for instance, a local broadcaster, the structure would be very different than it's typically this number of scenes. And I'm like, I'm realizing she sat down. Like, Tatiana has sat down yes. and clocked different formats at different, in different contexts to gain a profound understanding of what works where and how does that affect their pacing and so on. And it was the first time, and this is may, uh, maybe just five years ago or something, you know, I, that it even struck me, oh, oh, like that's how you learn. That's how it, you learn It's not on intuitive, your <laughs> like you have to figure out. And I think, yeah. I mean, you know, I meet so many people who are, are expert TV writers and, and certainly a lot of people even with TV production experience who have never asked themselves, is there a, a model for what what belongs where. They are very intuition based. Oh, they work from the, intuition the main, and experience, main, but not actual yeah. numbers or facts or understanding. No, they don't. Well, if they can say this is German uh, variation on Arrested Development or Buffy or whatever mm. it is that is uh, the, the inspiration to begin with, and then you put the scripts together and then Arrested Development or say uh, Big Bang Theory, whatever, you have 58 scenes and here you have 29 and the the, the tempo is just aghast. This is not a comedy. You cannot have four-page scene for a comedy with the dialogue, like this much dialogue that's boring. And even visually, you, all our arms are going up and nobody is reacting. So it's not difficult to learn. You just have to put some time to study and compare and count. And it's the basic screenwriting skill. But I don't understand really why schools are not teaching that. I, yeah, I genuinely that, that was my. That was like, OK, you, you have this degree and this degree from screenwriting, and somehow you missed comparison of scripts, that, that was to me sometimes alarming. I think established yeah. screenwriters also don't mm -hmm. do this, so, mm -hmm. so it, why would they, they don't think to teach it? It used mm -hmm. to be enough in a way, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little, but it used to be enough to understand like Aristotle and also mm -hmm. how long is that, like how many minutes is a commercial hour? You know, because that used to vary over mm -hmm. time. So, okay, are we right now? Are we working to a 42 minute hour or a 44 minute hour? Or, you know, and then that used to be pretty much what you needed to know. But now, like, there's so much more uh, now. But it's not mysterious. It's not like, oh, nobody knows. Like, no, clearly you can analyze your way to this. And then when you understand mm -hmm. the rules, maybe you can also intelligently break them. But that is something else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's like just four minutes difference between formats, sitcom and dramedy. You get five more minutes, 23 minutes to 28 minutes. What you can say in those five minutes, like it blows your mind how different the, the emotional content is. You just get five more minutes if you know what to do with them. So I, I got fascinated. I, I just got <laughs> completely fascinated by comparing all the time when I was learning, and, and that was fun. I'm fascinated yeah. by this idea of I mean, I, I know that Quibi didn't work out, and that I never thought that was a particularly good idea. But I'm interested in, in very short form content that young people are making, like even on, in media like Instagram, but, but like, sort of like micro, or TikTok, for instance, is a great mm -hmm. example. TikTok is training a generation of, of visual storytellers who can express themselves in three seconds, 15 seconds, you know, to, to make something emotional and physical happen in a very short time. Now, and that is also what a lot of these, these people are consuming. So, so of course it means that, that what a storyteller with that kind of agility can do with a five minute web series for like, mm. what, what, if, what if could we, can, you, can I get young people in a room and or like into a structure, you know, who are very visually talented and talented storytellers and, and may create a local production environment where they could do like, you know, five times five minutes of web drama for, for their own age group and see what happens. And like in a way, my, I, my suspicion is what would happen is they would start to copy all of those tired tropes of their ideas what television should be. Mm -hmm. But if you, could, if you could break through that mm -hmm. and have them just make whatever they're already doing but with more narrative, I think that's maybe the answer in a way. Like that's where we're gonna find the next people and then we can find what is the balance between these different traditions, what works in each medium mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't see us currently recruiting young writing and, and, and producing talent into TV drama 
and that is going to so the problem that feature film is having right now i think tv drama will have in 10 years mm. But that's yeah. all the initiative that we meet in the committees. That's why we are pushing for young people to come into established contexts. And everybody yeah. like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, nothing happens. <laughs> like that, that's, that's more or less the, the, the end result of it. Like. Yeah. But also check if those kinds of story may, stories may induce epilepsy in a viewer. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's not a joke, <laughs> you know, if you go too far. Remember the first Sherlock movie, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes? It, it really, I got <laughs> nauseated in the, in the theater. Like, why do they, no, they're cutting too fast? So it was the MTV <laughs> generation, you know, moral panic. You know, I remember this from the, the early nineties. Oh, yeah. But, but in a way, I have, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, you're right. Yeah. I mean, in a way, mm. the change also means that we're we're making ourselves irrelevant. It's really nice to sit here <laughs> and be like in my forties and think, you know, I'm so down with the kids. Clearly, I'm not down with the kids. No, and we are, yeah, and when cool. the next aesthetic generation comes, I may not understand it, and that's okay, because I also know that that the um, the tradition of european filmmaking at its best um, and the tradition of of, of qualitative uh, aesthetic you know art house filmmaking um, has a universal appeal like for people who are working in these traditions and, and in many ways you know if you if you listen to an, a director like bong yon ho he's very shaped by by of course the american storytelling tradition and and the european as as well um, and maybe, you know, we wouldn't maybe have American filmmaking without the European experiments, mm -hmm. which are all publicly funded. So, so, so that still has a big relevance for even for viewers who are very young. And, and they will certainly continue to engage with it, but they also have to be allowed to, to change it. Mm -hmm. Because why would we? I, I also am not excited about, you know, content that is stale. That said, you know, I did also see Escape from New York in a movie theater like last week. And that film is from 1981. <laughs> and that was also a lovely experience. And, and, you know, to have more opportunities like that, uh, I am looking for that is also a positive outcome of Corona. But let's be real like that is old people entertainment. You know, Th mm -hmm. that's that's OK. Like it. But but let's not make let's not allow in particular feature film to become like opera. You know, it shouldn't be ghettoized into this sort of reactionary art form that we have to preserve in its current just form, because, so yeah. the current makers can continue to clone people who are just like them, who will make work that is essentially the same. Mm -hmm. um, film is different than TV as well now that that it is on this balancing, teetering there with the artistic and the and the commercial, mm -hmm. and when it's at its best. It, it, it fulfills both purposes. And that's in a way like that's when art house works and when we have these crossover films, they are both. Mm. And, and of course that should be our goal. In a way that's the only kind of film that we should mm. be making. You know, and everything else, it's okay. If it becomes too arty or if it becomes too mainstream, maybe that should be because we failed in making the kind of film we were trying to make mm. all the time, which is the elevated mm. art house film. Well, I, I just want to share just, uh, uh, um, a surprising discovery for me, uh, just watching on, on uh, Swedish television, on online content, and suddenly there was Colombo there. And I, I've somehow missed it. I really, it's the one, probably the only classic uh, uh, detective show I've never watched, maybe just passed it on the television. So doing something and just catching the dialogue and it plonks me on the sofa like, what is this? And I listen and I listen and I watch, wow, it's like, how can it be 40 years later or whatever and it's still this is good Th that good and i can't explain and then i got started researching okay who brought oh steven botch okay i can connect it to i could recognize all the later references but in its first form and it was the early episodes as well i was mind blown so when something is well the first lectures i ma made were tv shows with no expiration that eloge colombo <laughs> still holds water it's amazing no, in, a, in a way, I, I yeah. just randomly, I've, I've ended up seeing some, you know, incredibly famous co comedies from the 1940s um, it, in the last few years. You know, just like, you know, film history classics that everybody mm -hmm. should know, but you know, some of you, nobody's seen all of them. And yeah. I, I just saw some and I, I keep being struck by the mm -hmm. quality of the writing yeah. or for that reason, Moonstruck, you know, which is mm -hmm. a, a film that I showed to some younger friends and they were so moved and and, and uplifted, and in particular, they were talking about the dialogue. You know, that script is just so gorgeous. Mm. And, and it's funny and fast, 
and intelligent and complex and emotionally real, even though they're very heightened, like they're not realistic aesthetically mm -hmm. and they're not realistic in these crazy comedies from the 40s or in or these, you know, stories. And the female characters in the 40s are allowed so much power and complexity. So it's also that the, mm -hmm. we, we remember like, oh, but in the past, everything was, you know, so simplified or the gender no. roles were so, mm -hmm. no, there, that has, that's also a wave. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to go back to, oh, like this was possible in Hollywood in, you know, in, in the 1940s, mm. why isn't it possible? Like what yeah. happened in the 50s to make us forget, yeah. you know? And you have yeah. to think about these tendencies yeah. and then think about where we're going.